the last day. I recognize most of you should be exhausted by the amount of lectures, hackathon, competition, and uh, the amount of code you've written uh, in the past few days. Um, you worked really hard in the last two days about different use cases. So we have 16 teams and 16 use cases, all different. Today you're gonna give your presentation. So we did split the 16 teams into two groups of eight teams, and each group will have a different jury. And the best two teams from each uh, jury will be uh, said to be the, the winning teams. Um, the use cases you've been working on uh, for the past two days or so were a combination of use cases brought by the industry and internal use cases brought by Quantinium. And those are, I would say, much more complex and mature than the use cases you could have found two or three years ago. And it's a testimony of how um, the whole industry or the whole field kind of evolved in this past few days. So first of all, thank you very much for being part of that. Uh, it's not a trivial effort by far, so I recognize that when I saw all the different teams in the different rooms you were working hard, and, uh, and those are not easy problems. If the problems you were tackling in two days could be solved in two days, people would know it and the, the industry would be totally different. But this is only the beginning. You've been working in the past two days with a team, maybe going to collaborate again and continue working with the teams and maybe the mentors, either the mentors from Continuum or the mentors from the industrial uh, companies. And I actually strongly encourage all the different companies that came to the hackathon to reinvite again the participants internally to give internally the presentations to keep a momentum after the hackathon. Because we don't want a hackathon, we don't want the whole quantum effort to stop tonight. We want to have a momentum and continue because we're building together something that is not only for this week, but for the next years or decades to come. So you will be giving your presentations this morning until around 12-ish. So every single team is gonna give a presentation of 10 minutes plus five minutes of questions and answers. As I told you on Friday morning, uh, yeah, Friday morning, you will be judged by both the, the jury members and the mentors. So the ratio of the marks is like two thirds for the jury and one third from your mentors. Uh, and after we're done with the presentation, we'll reconvene this afternoon in a exceptional venue in central Trieste called La Sala uh, uh, Piccola Fenice. We'll have shuttles bringing you from the ICTP to there. Uh, and we'll have a welcome speech from the director of the ICTP and the founder of Continuum. And we'll be giving all the awards and we'll have a fun cocktail time and you'll be able to network with the people from the different companies, people from Continuum, and you'll be able to relax after this intense week. And I, I know what this is. So um, on this short introduction, I will let uh, Thomas uh, re-indicate again the splitting of the two teams, say uh, the team names assigned to uh, the two juries, and uh, he'll be the master of the ceremony. So Thomas, please go ahead. We did all the food for 140 people, so you better eat. <laughs> It's going to be very quick. I'm just going to um, say which team uh, will move to the second room, Aula Stasi, uh, on the first floor. And can you hear me? No. Further away. OK, perfect. <laughs> Um, and which teams will stay here. So in, uh, in the team that will leave uh, are team number two, Air Jordan Wigner. Uh, the team number three, with no name, I don't know. Uh, team number six, Any Sun. Team number eight, uh, Captain Quantum. Team number 11, D Raktors. Team number 12, ZX. Team number 13, Alpha plus minus Alpha and uh, team 14, Q Disco Search. You can already stand up. <laughs> oh, and, and use your laptop for the presentation, actually. Yeah. If that's okay. And every other team, I'm just gonna repeat them for, to avoid confusion, but every other team stays here. So that will be uh, team one, Quantum Anti-Fraud Squad, team four, GBQ, GBQ, 
Ouais, j'ai pas, j'ai pas la ref. Ouais, ouais, ça marche. Team 5, 5 guys. Team 7, average dodo enjoyers. Team 9, no name. Team 10, no name. Uh, team 15, quantum fire cats. And team 16, eigen criminals. Okay. And that will be the order of passage. So uh, I will welcome team 1, quantum anti-fraud squad, to start set up um, con calma. No, there's no rush for now. Um, and già avere la presentazione aperta. Stiamo aspettando che tocchi comunque. Ok, perfetto. Abbiamo un Ok. Forse la posso usare qua? Prova, prova. Well, if you need to just slide up. Speak. Slide up? Yes. For, for talking, slide yes. up. Just speaking for. Devi tirare su per parlare. Okay. So, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, everybody. We are Quantum Anti Fraud Squad. As, as the name of the team says, we, are, we were tasked by Intesa San Paolo to solve a fraud detection problem with quantum machine learning algorithm. So in this presentation, we will start by seeing the data and then apply classical method, methods to analyze them. Then we will move to quantum and compare the results of the two approaches. So let's start with data. We had a highly unbalanced data set uh, containing uh, 500,000 uh, financial transactions. And how you can see in this graph, uh, already had 10 transactions per users. We recovered 99% of our uh, distribution. Uh, the, the data set has 15 different features. Some of them are continuous, like the timestamp at which the transaction occurs in time, and others are categorical, like for example the ID of the bank user. Uh, we have just one column for the target, which is uh, the, the, fraud, uh, the fraud column. Uh, here, the, uh, the, the entries are binary, and zero stands for illegal transactions, while uh, one stands for a fraudulent one. Uh, the problem is that, that uh, this uh, data set is highly unbalanced. In fact, uh, the ratio of the ones over the zeros is like 2%. So the ones are 2% of our total data set, so to speak. And uh, we try to overcome this problem uh, with uh, quantum computing methods, but we also applied uh, some classical methods to see uh, the performance and compare, uh, and compare them. So, first of all, we did some reduction of the data. The first one, uh, we applied PCA to re reduce the features from 15 to 2. 
And second one, we reduce the total number of entries because, uh, you know, we need to produce some results before the end of this hackathon, so it was quite uh, needed. Uh, for example, here we have um, a population of uh, 1,000. You can see the two reduced features and how they displace themselves in the, in the plane for the train set and the test set. In orange, uh, we outlined the faulty transactions and in blue, the regular one. And as you can see from this graph, there is no trivial kernel function we can split, which can split the faulty from the, the legal ones. So this problem is not trivial. And as a, how I, I was saying, first of all, we applied some classical machine learning algorithms. We applied lo logistic regression, which squashes the results uh, of the predictions between zero and one to interpret them as uh, probabilities. We also applied XGBoost, which uh, relies on uh, uh, three decisions algorithm and also a support vector machine, which tries to find the best hypersurface, which splits the, the, the true predictions from the false one. Uh, we also tried to use uh, a time series approach for this data set, but uh, we concluded that uh, it was uh, not uh, a, a possible way, and so we, we just, uh, stop at uh, trying to solve this problem with a time series approach. So let's move to the quantum part. I will let you speak my teammate, Antonio. So related to the uh, quantum approach, we use a variational quantum circuit, which is an hybrid model composed by a quantum evaluation and a classical optimizer. The variational quantum circuit is composed of an encoding um, circuit in green here and a variational part in uh, uh, red. And uh, uh, the encoding part is used to embed the data in the quantum circuit, while uh, for the variational, uh, is composed of rotational angle, uh, rotational gates, and the angle parameter are optimized classically. Moving to the, uh, the model uh, developed, uh, we use, uh, for the encoding, we use an encoding uh, with the Rx gate and Ry gate. And then for the uh, variational part, uh, is composed of uh, a rotational gate followed by uh, an entangling block um, uh, with uh, Sinot. And this kind of circuit is also developed by Maria Schuld in his article, uh, circuit-centric quantum classifier, and uh, uh, for our model we use uh, uh, eight different uh, parameter layer. And another technique developed is the uh, replotting technique, which, uh, uh, which um, it consists of re-encode the data each time a new parameter block is added, and we try uh, the model with and without this technique. Now uh, we proceed uh, analyzing the obtained results. As my colleague uh, mentioned, uh, we performed the test uh, considering uh, 10 uh, number of epochs uh, and uh, using as encoding technique uh, Rx and uh, Ry and with uh, two features. On uh, the Y axis, uh, we have the recall, which is the most important figure of merit for this kind of application, which is uh, the percentage of uh, samples uh, um, correctly classified um, for the uh, belonging the class of interest uh, that in this case is the class one, one of the fraud. And we have on the other axis uh, the number of transactions for which we perform the test. We have that the quantum methods, the variation of quantum classifier is the purple one, and we identify the application or not of the reuploading technique with a different uh, uh, form of the uh, spot in particular. We have that uh, the square uh, purple spot, uh, which corresponds to the variational quantum circuits uh, with, uh, without the reuploading technique, uh, is uh, the best one uh, for what concerns the recall figure of merit, and so how to perform all the other classical methods considered for comparison. Uh, then, in uh, this slide, we can see the uh, training time of uh, all the considered method as function of the number of transactions. 
we have that uh, uh, the variational quantum circuits is uh, clearly the slowest one, but in particular we have also that uh, without reuploading technique is faster. Uh, the quantum methods is the slowest one because uh, we choose uh, to uh, perform the test using uh, a classical simulator of a quantum computer in order to evaluate the quality of the algorithm, the quality of the approach, without uh, have uh, issues related on non-ideal phenomena. Um, then we can observe the same type of trend. Uh, if you notice the runtime as function of the uh, number of transactions, and so also in this case the variational quantum circuit is the slowest uh, due to the uh, classical simulation of a quantum computer, which requires a lot of uh, matrix vector multiplication. In this slide, we try to consider together the recall, which is the most important figure of merit, and the training time, fixing the number of transactions at uh, 10,000. We have uh, that uh, the variational quantum circuits uh, uh, without the reploading technique, uh, the purple square, is the best one for what concerns uh, the, uh, the performance and so the recall, uh, but uh, it's clearly uh, not the, really the worst one for what concerns the training time, but uh, uh, in general the true quantum approach are the worst one. The really worst one is uh, the variational quantum circuit uh, with the reploading technique. Uh, the same trend can be identified if you consider the run time, run, the run time as function of the recall. And uh, uh, our work uh, proves that uh, quantum computing um, uh, is promising for overcoming uh, some limitation of uh, classical machine learning, and that uh, in particular can help uh, in an uh, um, application in which the data set is strongly unbalanced, like this one. Uh, we can uh, further improve our model with uh, uh, more time, clearly, uh, changing uh, the type of encoding and identifying uh, the best one uh, with uh, the, the possible in the literature, and uh, also optimizing all the hyperparameters involved in the model. And clearly, training and runtime should be reduced uh, by exploiting uh, the real hardware, but uh, when uh, the, um, the non-ideal phenomena uh, are, uh, will be reduced with a better type of quantum hardware. Uh, thank you for your attention. We are open for questions. Hi, thank you for the presentation. When you compare the classical models with the quantum, how do you make sure the comparison is fair? Like what size of the classical, what architecture of each classical model is the, um, the fair one to compare against a given variational quantum circuit of a specific size and ansatz? Uh, we use uh, the same uh, uh, data set, so uh, with the PCA apply, with the same type of uh, rescaling apply uh, in both cases. Moreover, we consider the same uh, condition, operating conditions, so the same threshold for classical method and quantum method. All these things uh, to have a, a more fair possible comparison uh, between the classical and quantum method. You say it all from... Okay, so the way you pre-process the data set is the yeah, same? It's, it's the, the same, same data same. set, of and course. The same size, so the same number of transaction. That yes, is the yes. Most but what about the models? What because the, the models have hyperparameters, right? The model, sorry? The models can have hyperparameters, or not? Yes, uh, have uh, hyperparameters, -param and the parameters that uh, we, uh, that is the same uh, in particular, is for example the threshold. So when we measure in the uh, classical, uh, using uh, the classical method, we set the threshold so uh, to 0 0.1, and also for the variational uh, quantum circuit. So in this way, it's the same. Uh, the, uh, the reading is uh, quite uh, could be quite the same. So are comparable for this uh, for this uh, kind of stuff. So to have the more fair possible comparison. Um, did you, you probably didn't have time, uh, but I assume all these simulations with the, the quantum simulator uh, was noiseless? Is that right? Noiseless, yes. Noiseless. Okay, okay. Um, do you, this might be an unfair question. Do you have a sense of how it might perform with noise? Probably don't. Uh, 
Uh, no, we have not tried with noise. So. Because it's for evaluating the quality of the method and uh, having the noise that can uh, clearly decrease uh, too much the performance for, for having a fair comparison with the classical method with have not th this type of problem. And could you remind me how many uh, shots you needed to, or how many, um, yeah, how many shots you needed to, to train the? the uh, how many shots? Uh, no, we use, um, uh, I don't remember, maybe, maybe uh, one or one, no, 10,000 10, maybe. Right, cool. I Thanks. have to check, but perfect. Maybe you said this already. Hmm? What is the state of the art? What is the state of the art? Yes. Uh, the state of the art, uh, for the state of the art, uh, for the um, encoding method, uh, there are uh, different approach. There is the amplitude encoding, which consists of um, um, encode the data as amplitude, um, as a, 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 the amplitude, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't, as the amplitude of the state, sorry, I have uh, And uh, um, we can say that uh, for uh, this kind of model, we developed a new type of encoding, but uh, the RX, RY um, uh, um, type of circuit. Why this? Because uh, we think that uh, uh, this kind of encoding should, um, um, can uh, obtain a good performance for this kind of uh, classification because uh, add, adding uh, some uh, complexity of the, on the model. And so for the... Uh, um, uh, considering considering the, difficulty, the, 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 the difficulties of the data set, it's better to have a more complex... Uh, encoding while a more easier one. And for the amplitude encoding, while for the amplitude encoding, uh, uh, there are uh, uh, some limitation for the um, accuracy generally. I have tried uh, this. And last question. What do people use in the real world? That's what I mean by the state of the art. What models are used in industry for this mo uh, problem? For this kind of model? Uh, in the industry, uh, so in Tesla, they tried uh, this kind of, uh, this kind, in the classical world. Uh, or the classical world, the what cla is the method that they use? Uh, yes. Or generally, uh, they use uh, uh, logistic, uh, it's uh, GBoost SVM, generally. So the, the model that... Uh, so it's one of the things you try. Yes, yeah, more okay. or less the best one classically is the logistic regression uh, currently but uh, we have to perform uh, uh, it uh, with our model. All right, thank you. Okay. You're, welcome. You're welcome. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> team two, I mean, the second team here. Team four, yeah. Already, or, or it was from them. It was from them, but we can have that one. And it's not clicking. Oh, okay. Top bottom. Pointing. Okay. And does it also pass the slides, or we have to pass on the laptop? Uh, if you have the laptop, yeah. you can connect with the USB. Is it okay? Yes. Is it okay? Take it out then. Okay, perfect. This is uh, mo uh, mirroring the screen or uh, extending? Uh, it's uh, uh, settings from the right. So I have to go to display, basically. Right? Yes. Let's try. Yeah, 
Which which is the macro point and the one on the right, huh? Uh, that's true. Uh, both, sorry. Yes, you need to speak in front of or uh, on the mic. Why is it like not? Uh, uh, we can try. Like with here it says that the mirror is here, but the other one is. Oh, maybe you can, you can send by email the presentation. Maybe with the adapter we do, we do directly HDMI here. There's an HDMI. Oh, okay. You can try. It's right. not appearing. Do you have the presentation? I can. Yeah, it's on Slack. It's a less version of Slack. Okay, sit on there. I think we click some eye. Oh, okay. Okay, perfect. <coughs> okay, yeah. so the pointer. Please speak always in front of me. So the pointer, how does it work? Huh? Just yeah. point the first point. Ah, okay. I'm practicing. Okay, so you should point like this, uh, right? Yes, you can check the change. Okay. No, no, no with the pointer. The pointer. Ah, okay, okay. Does it change? Yes. Oh, cool. Okay. But should I, so if I should stay here, I, I cannot really see the lights too much. So you can stay here, come here. But the microphone doesn't work, right? <laughs> ah, okay. Oh, I can just stay here, and it's fine. I can, I can point even with the arrow on the... On the yes, 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 okay. I remember okay. that you are the recorder and the live stream on YouTube. Okay, okay, it's fine. Uh, can I just start uh, when I want? I can start? Okay, okay, nice. Okay, good morning. We are uh, group four and uh, we worked with uh, Generali on the analysis of systemic credit risk on its devices. Uh, and we implemented an approach based on QAOA and digitized counter diabetic QAOA. So we were supervised by uh, Matteo and mentored by Yoshi. Uh, just as a brief outline of the problem, financial markets and institu institutions are nowadays uh, highly interconnected, uh, like in a network. So the default or uh, the downgrade, which means the failure or the risk of failure of a company, can affect other companies. Uh, and in particular, there can be a contagion effect, uh, just like it's in a network. So it is interesting to try to estimate quantitatively uh, this contagion effect through the market. In our case, we were concerned with a smaller subsection of the financial market that we can think about as a portfolio. So a portfolio for our interest is just a collection of companies that we can label from one to N, on which we invested if, for instance, we are the owners of the portfolio. So if you map each company to the vertex of a graph, then you can ask yourself the following question. Say, for instance, that company one fails. Does the risk propagate uh, to company three with a probability that is larger than zero? If so, you draw an edge of a uh, directed uh, weighted graph with uh, uh, the weight of the edge that is proportional to the probability of contagion. So in the end of the day, the portfolio can be represented as a directed acyclic graph with uh, uh, weighted edges. And in particular, in this, in this example, you can see, for instance, that uh, the number one is a big company that is uh, uh, affecting most of the market uh, that, that is uh, interconnected with. So if company one face, it is a problem for the rest of the network, while the seven can be thought as a small startup. It is influenced by the rest of the network, uh, but itself, if it fails, it doesn't really influence the rest of the uh, financial market. Yeah, sure. Yes, yes. Uh, um, I mean, the direction is important. So you can have an arrow pointing from one to three. It means that if one... You also have an arrow pointing from three to one yes. in the same Okay, this is actually, uh, if you write the cost function, you pay a cost for it. So it's something we don't want in the solution. So in principle, an optimal solution should not have these uh, double arrows. You can have it, but in the cost function, if you have a term like this, you pay an energy cost. Okay, so there is a penalty for it somehow. Because it, it's usually not, I mean, it can be the case that both companies influence each other. It can be the case in the cube of formulation that I'm gonna talk about shortly, uh, which is uh, taken from other papers. Uh, they really don't, uh, I mean, it's possible, but they don't put uh, a, a probability on that that it is high. It's something like a, a rare, a small probability for these configurations. So.
Um, so in practice, uh, in uh, our problem, uh, we have a data set, uh, which is a collection of time series. We have a time series for each of the companies of the market. And uh, in particular, this data, I mean, uh, they're a little bit complicated and coming from the financial world, they are default credit swap. But for our interests, I mean, for our concerns, uh, they are basically an estimate of the risk. So if you have uh, high values of these functions, it means that uh, you have a high risk of failure. And for instance, here you see this peak in 2020, it was due to the pandemic shock. While here, more recently, this year, there was this uh, um, crisis initiated by the Silicon Valley Bank that propagated through the network. And you see that also Credit Suisse had a very high risk of default, and in the end it actually defaulted. And the same, uh, you see there is a correlation uh, with the other companies. So I mean, I don't have time to go uh, through the details, but the idea is that you take this time series, you take a snapshot of them, so a, a finite interval of time, and you also uh, translate in time these snapshots so that you count for causality from one snapshot to the other. And then uh, what you want to do is, uh, given this data set, it's an inverse problem, you want to reconstruct the optimal graph uh, that is uh, describing uh, this uh, uh, propagation of risk through the network. So let's say that after two plus hours of interesting modeling calculations, this can be mapped into Kubo problem. And in particular, you have different terms in the Hamiltonian. You have a cost function, which is just representing the cost of a graph, so you want to minimize it. And then we have some penalties. So we have uh, one penalty that is accounted for the existence of a maximum number of parents for a node. So this means that, for instance, if you fix m equal to, you pay an energy cost in this configuration where you have three parents pointing to the same node. While, uh, yes, you also have a, a three, you have a penalty if you have three cycles, because it is something you don't want to have usually. So if you have uh, uh, n companies uh, and you fix this parameter m equals 2, you have uh, a Kubo formulation with a number of uh, binary variables that scales quadratically. And you can do the usual uh, encoding, the base encoding, uh, uh, in the I mean, quantum uh, spin z uh, Paulis. So the name of our group is generally battery if it is quantum, and we also added uh, uh, gate-based, uh, because the previous work was done with uh, quantum annealers, uh, which have usually a limited connectivity, and you are restricted to cubo problems. In our case, it is m equal to. You can demonstrate if you have uh, m larger or equal than 3. It's not a cubo problem. It implies higher order terms in the z values. So we use a gate-based approach. Uh, and in particular, I mean, I don't have the time to go through the details of QAOA, but it is basically a hybrid classical uh, variation algorithm where you have an answer that is layered. Each layer has a structure. In one case, QAOA, you have a mixer term generated by Pauli X and the problem Hamiltonian. In the other case, you have a term coming from the theory of counter diabeticity. So the main improvements of our methods on the state of the art are that we have all-to-all -all connectivity, for instance, in quantum devices, we perform the uh, um, simulation on the emulator and we can think about future work. And also we can go beyond Kubo because we can implement uh, higher order terms uh, with the usual decomposition into gates. So I say that the number of qubits scales quadratically in the number of companies, uh, so the number of nodes of the network, uh, but actually there can be a dimensionality reduction that can be performed uh, with some uh, methods. Uh, and you see that you still have a quadratic uh, scaling, but this is uh, quite improved in practice. Uh, so you have the number of qubits uh, on the y-axis, uh, and you see that, uh, I mean, you can perform simulation with a larger number of companies also on these devices. So now I will leave the floor to my friend for the results. Uh, the algorithm for dimensionality reduction uh, was already implemented, uh, but the idea is that if you have a matrix uh, that is describing the correlation between companies, uh, you put basically a threshold on the correlations uh, and you ignore uh, those uh, matrix elements that are small enough. So you kind of put a threshold. Uh, so the matrix is now sparse. Uh, sorry? Some kind of constraint. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So now you have a sparse matrix. Uh, and this makes it uh, easier. You know, you can reduce the number of uh, qubits uh, that uh, you need for your encoding. I mean, to be honest, I didn't have the time to go through the details. So how you actually find this Kubo formulation is a long calculation. But if you put the constraints, uh, the number of variables you need are less. Yeah, so for results, uh, basically what the first thing we want to show here is the actual uh, optimization problem, the outcome of the optimization using QAOA and DCQAOA. So uh, we ran this problem 
for uh, a thousand steps for both three, four, and five companies. And this corresponds to, equip, like, to nine, 10, 10, and 15 qubits. And here we're basically showing that for each problem, we ran 20 instances of QAOA and the CQAOA. And in the graphs, we have as the dashed line is the average of these 20 instances. The shaded area is basically the standard deviation from it, and the solid colors are the best case, so the case that achieved the better result. In this case, the better result, what we want is to achieve higher values, closer to one, because this is the normalized energy. So we divide the energy that our, uh, we are finding in our circuit from the exact ground state energy. Uh, so higher is better. And uh, as we can see here, uh, the CQAOA outperformed by far QAOA in this case. We found using QAOA algorithms, specifically both cases for P equals one, so for one layer, uh, we found with QAOA, uh, let's say half of the actual uh, energy that we wanted to achieve, and the CQAOA usually converged way closer, like closer to 90, a lot percent, let's say. Uh, another interesting outcome is actually analyzing. As I said, we ran this in problem for 20 instances for each case, for like three, four, and five companies. So uh, it's interesting to see the success probability for each one of these instances that a problem is run. So basically this means how probable it is that in that instance I actually found the correct brown state. And we see that for three companies, nine qubits, uh, we basically for most of the instances, we found the ground state or have a very, very high probability of finding the ground state. And that changes a little bit when we increase the dimension of the problem and we have four and five instances because then we go to a more sparse regime, let's say, where just in a few of the instances, I actually have a non-zero probability of, of finding the ground states. Uh, and specifically for four companies, uh, in these cases that is non-zero at least is still very high, like 90, a lot percent, uh, but for five, it starts to decrease a little bit, and this ranges from uh, 50 to 70 percent for the non-zero instances. So basically, you will run. Uh, so you run it a lot of times, and you calculate when you find the ground state, right? So. The, the, the yes, what? exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the. Uh, yeah, the exactly. Function, right? the, when we solve the problem, we get a bit string because it's a classical Hamiltonian, and bit string will solve the problem. We, we can decode it, and this probability is probability of finding the bit, that bit string. Okay. Yeah, so for example, in this case, for example, it's 60%, so we get 60% probability. The ground, the ground. Yeah. All of the ground string, perfect, exactly. Uh, yes. Uh, Adam, Adam Optimus. This is yeah. a simulator with Adam Optimizer, yes. Uh, why not? Yes? Sorry? Oh. No, we, what we do, what we actually do on, can do on a quantum device is, is find the gradients <coughs> using parameter shift rule. And then we can apply Adam, because once we have gradients, it's, there is a function to evaluate this. Parameter shift rule is much easier to do in experiments. And that and that's what we've done here. Yeah, here also we are using parameter shift rule, so also for the simulation, because we need to we need to keep track what will happen with the real, real device also. Because yeah, as I said before, we ran this uh, problem multiple times. Uh, first in simulation, but then we also went and uh, ran it one instance of the problem or like like one instance of the problem specifically for the, five, the case of five companies on the emulator, the continuum emulator, the H11. And uh, here we are showing the result that we got out of it. We were basically, in the x-axis, we have the possible bit strings that uh, our system can, uh, the, the possible states of our system, and the probability of actually that, say, that state occur in the, this, in the emulation. So, and this, the high bar here is actually ground state, so in this, em in this run, we found that the ground state with 60 something, 66 around percent probability. And this graph that is being shown uh, inside the picture is basically the representation of the network with the directed graph that Pietro explained uh, based on uh, this bit string that is the, the, the output of the model. Yeah. 
So just to summarize and give some perspectives, uh, we implemented a variational quantum algorithm for a financial use case, uh, and we saw that we can improve scalability and uh, improve quantum circuit ansets. We did some actual experiments on uh, a continuum emulator, and that can help us prove that the actual uh, our problem is actually implementable. Uh, and for future work, uh, as one was mentioned before, this uh, annealing part uh, was only possible to solve this problem for cubo formulations. And we think that we can, we know that we, with our approach, we can actually run it for uh, uh, beyond cubo problems, so we can find uh, higher correlations. And uh, we also want to perform actual experiments, like on actual devices with uh, continuum. We wanted to run this by this weekend, but it was. Uh, not possible. Uh, and uh, also another interesting problem is including time dependence so that our actually Bayesian network is not static, but uh, yeah, varies in time. So we can analyze how that affects the, the approach. And yeah, that was it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, due to, in, in the interest of time, I'll only take one question. Um, Kieran, do you want to? You're good, Constantinos. You compared the, the two QAOAs against each other. Yes. Um, what about classical stuff? What about, sorry? Classical methods. Classical methods with simulated annealing. Uh, classical method has already been shown complexity of NP complete. So this problem is NP complete, by learning Bayesian network. So we didn't go for it because we already knew kind of what complexity it is. And the other reason was we are we wanted to go just for NISC, NISC devices, so we have around 20 qubits available. So we thought that it would be a better alternative to just stick to uh, making the quantum uh, processes better, so better than QAOA, and then just compare both the quantum methods. But yeah, so we already know the complexity. Thank you. One thing to keep in mind is one okay. One thing is the theoretical complexity, which is worst case scenario. Yes. Principle. Mm -hmm. But here, this is in practice, and it's average case, yep. and finite system sizes, and stuff like that. So if you were to write a paper on this, mm -hmm. you would have to have a classical method to compare against, some baseline, yep. to see if you beat it with QAOA, and then you need a fair way to compare. Do you have an idea what would that be, if yep. you wanted to do it? Yeah, the classical method uh, would be some uh, uh, machine learning, uh, classical machine learning on the Bayesian network. And uh, uh, I mean, to be uh, fair and honest, uh, clearly you can uh, take a larger system sizes uh, with classical methods because you see the scaling uh, is actually pretty good, but I mean, you can do a way larger number of companies. Uh, it would be interesting for sure to like benchmark our quantum meters uh, versus the classical in the regime where we can actually perform the quantum simulations. Uh, this would be uh, very interesting. Uh, and I think the, I mean, the code uh, is also available. Um, I mean, uh, so we can, uh, we can actually do it if we go on working on that. Nice. And Thanks. As a suggestion, before trying, before trying the machine learning thing, I would just try to do some uh, you know, energy minimization on the classical. So yeah. basically thing. we can do simulated annealing because QAO is simulated kind of annealing. Yeah. annealing yeah. based. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So simulated sure. annealing would be the first step. Yeah, this would be the first step to go. Yeah. 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 Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Five guys. Love the name, by the way. Start when you're ready, of course. Okay. 
Mm. Let's connect. Okay. Your pointer. Remember to speak in front of the microphone. No, it's not a continue. No, maybe. I think we need to say something. Is it this one that is uh, projected? Yes, this one is projecting. Uh, okay. uh, actually, I'm looking at uh, this one. Okay. Arrange. Arrange. Supposed to display here before? Or? No, 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 mm. no. That one and the big screen. Uh, maybe, okay, let's put a H directly HDMI. Uh. Sometimes, like the, the connectors are a bit shitty. Okay. Uh, good morning everyone, uh, we are the five guys uh, working on the Quandela Challenge, which is uh, all about uh, the variational quantum Egan solver on uh, photonic devices. So, so uh, we are going to go straight into our problem statement, which is uh, all about finding the ground state of uh, some uh, Molecule. So suppose we are given a molecule, maybe uh, for example, in our case, which we took hydrogen, the hydrogen molecule and the lithium hydride molecule. We want to find the ground state of this molecule. So uh, uh, the problem it can be modeled as uh, in terms of the time independent Schrodinger equation, which is uh, given uh, in terms of uh, the eigenvalue problem, and our Hamiltonian, which is the electronic Hamiltonian is given as such. So we must uh, note that uh, this electronic Hamiltonian is uh, quite uh, difficult to implement on a classical, on a quantum computer. So we are going to uh, do some uh, steps which uh, we are not going to outline here, which is going to put the Hamiltonian in a form which can be implemented in a, in a quantum computer. So. <clears throat> To continue with this, we are going to use the variational quantum Egan solver approach to find the ground state of this Hamiltonian. So what are we going to do? We are going to start with uh, a wave function with uh, some given parameters. So we are going to parameterize this wave function and then use it to find the ground state of, this, uh, of the Hamiltonian of our system, which we are going to be working on. So the this setup, uh, this setup here is the setup for the variational quantum Egan solver, which uh, we are going to prepare our ground state, our uh, st wave function, which is in terms of uh, the parameters. We are going to prepare it uh, in in, uh, with some quantum gates, and we are going to, in terms of some parameters, we are going to uh, be iteratively changing this uh, parameter until we are going to have a better uh, approximation of the ground state uh, of this Hamiltonian. 
So to continue with our problem, I'm going to give an uh, opportunity for my group member to continue. Okay, so for, to solve this problem, we, we use a photonic device, which is a, a bit different uh, as a, a gate-based, like in the way we have to program it. Um, indeed, uh, instead of qubits, we... What are the variables, H, I, H, I, J? I mean, we started with the Schrodinger equation in the continuum, like before. So you have the, the electrons going around, uh, uh, ions, and now they became spins. How did you, what's the encoding? Uh, you, need, you need to make some mapping with a jordan wignall transformation in order to get to this Hamiltonian. Okay, but jordan wignall transformation works on a chain. Yeah, but here you have like, Martin. I think you can encode this in terms of creation and annihilation operators for the electrons with two sides, basically, because you have, yep. Okay. Uh, and for you? Um, yeah, I'm not completely sure about that, but because you have two electrons in the end for the H2, for example. So but do you, do you, you discretize LH. space? In a lattice, do you uh, use an orbital basis? What do you do? Uh, but no, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, okay. This Hamiltonian was uh, in the description of our problem, so I guess this is the way we have to modelize it. Uh, okay. I, I don't, want, don't want to take more time. Please go on. So, um, so indeed, in we are uh, we're using photonic device. So, uh, uh, the way to, to program a circuit in, in a photonic device is a bit different. Uh, we have uh, because we don't have qubits, we have uh, we have optical modes, and um, uh, we can see that uh, to uh, uh, create a qubit with uh, an optical device, we 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 can use two modes. Uh, and for for instance, like the the, the, the state zero uh, will be um, will be uh, one photon in the first mode, zero photon in the second mode, and state one will be uh, zero photon in first mode, and one photon in the in the second mode. Uh, also, we don't have gates, but we have uh, two tools, like one beam splitter and uh, a phase shifter. Um, both can be parameterized, uh, uh, so a beam splitter can, uh, can rotate the state and uh, we can parameterize the angle and uh, a phase shifter can uh, uh, shift the phase, <laughs> the parameterized phase. Um, so to implement the circuit, um, we first wrote a, a, a gate-based version. Uh, uh, so the idea is to explore like uh, all the space with two qubits. So we created this circuit like with uh, seven parameters. Um, and, uh, and then we, we, we found a way to implement it uh, with a photonic device. So instead of two qubits, we have four modes. Uh, and we use like a beam splitter uh, and some phase shifters here. And uh, in the middle, we have like a, a CNOT gate, which will uh, uh, we will present in the next slide how it is implemented. So, about the synod gate. So, of course, we know that we have to translate from the qubit gates to the photonic gates. So, the first way to do a synod gate is, of course, with four channel, four photonic channels, and this is what we've done in the classical simulation of the device. But when you go to the actual photonic device, there is many, because of the photonic nature, there is many mistakes that are gonna happen, and you're gonna have to check if the result is good, correct, or incorrect. So in order to do that, you, you need to add, in the synod gate, two additional uh, channels that are here, and this one here. And the rest of it is just the synod gate, how it is done with the beam splitters. 
Okay, and then once we know how to do those synod gates, we can come back to the general uh, to the general architecture of the circ of the um, process, the algorithm. So the first thing is we need to run the circuit on the photonic device. This has to be done multiple times. The reason for that is that we're going to measure the mean value of polys. And uh, again, in, if you want to compute the mean value of the X polys or the Z polys, for example, you need to run the circuit multiple times. Once this is done, um, okay, so you run the circuit. And then you compute the mean energy. So in order to do this, you need to have a translation from the photonic device to the qubit uh, qubit basis, I mean the poly basis. And then once this is done, you just run this function many times and optimize the parameter, right, in order to minimize this energy. Yeah, we can we can now show our our results, and um, actually, like we can see that our simulation, our expected values from uh, the theoretical model, uh, are perfectly fit each other. So, like uh, we were we were really g glad of getting this uh, plot because uh, behind uh, each one of these points uh, there is a. Uh, there is an optimization variation, uh, variation quantum Hagen solver that is run and is given the right answer, and um, it gives. Uh, we see so we see a very good accordance with the simulation. So these are simulations; these are not experiments. Then we tried to uh, to use also to run our our uh, algorithm also on a QPU uh, by Candela, and. Um, Actually, like uh, we can see, we we tried with noise and without noise. So that you uh, permit, uh, like uh, through the use of some parameters that you can set when you build up your circuit. And uh, what we got is not really. Uh, we tried this for just one ground energy, so one, um, so just one value. This is the value we were expecting, and uh, we can see that we didn't achieve that. Because like this is uh, uh, this represents the number of iterations and the value of energy. So we see we expect the energy to go down uh, to the ground state energy, but we see that the, we we weren't able to achieve this probably because we didn't give enough iterations or uh, because the the circuit implemented had some problems with the parameters, and uh, we. Uh, we have been like uh, studying this problem uh, yesterday night also, but uh, didn't find any answer. So uh, yeah, this is what what we got so far. All right. Um, so after doing the hydrogen atom, we want to extend to bigger molecules, so the lithium hydrogen atom. Um, and for the lithium hydrogen, we need four qubits, and uh, one of these little units of unitaries, C naught and unitaries is a small unit. And we want to figure out um, where we want to put our C naught gates so that um, we use minimal possible C naught gates because the more C naughts we introduce into our system, uh, the more complicated uh, the algorithm becomes and the more time it takes to run. And so to choose uh, which qubits we want to put the C naught gates uh, on. We want to compute some entanglement coefficient to see uh, which qubits are the most entangled. Uh, and we use this formula, which is based on von Neumann entropy, to compute these coefficients uh, to tell us how entangled uh, any two qubits are. And uh, we found that Q1 and Q2 are very entangled, Q1 and Q3, and uh, Q2 and Q3. Uh, yeah. okay. um, so the main learnings and challenges from uh, this project for us was uh, learning how to scale to larger molecules because it's more computationally expensive and um, also, we learned that photonics is a great technology. Um, 
and uh, also running in the cloud is quite challenging as well because you introduce other problems. So uh, we'll take any questions and thank you for listening. So can I ask you a question? There's a question from the back. What reference are you using for your initial test? Uh, for, for... Where you started using the program. Ah, so the input state. Equation again, please. I think we we have some code for it. <laughs> um, so we kind of took it from one of these papers uh, based on MI. Uh, I don't remember what MI stands for. Um, it's yeah. I'm not sure if I can answer that. So the No, we don't. We don't know which classical method we. we have. And then finally, you said one thing about the parameters. Yeah, with the real simulation on uh, QPU. Yeah, actually, like um, our results were not really encouraging because um, it was taking really long time to take each of these iteration. And like um, at some point, it wasn't converging. Like we see that it starts oscillating, and uh, we think that it was because uh, uh, there are two actual ways to implement the C not on a uh, on a quantum uh, device. For the simulation, we used one, but for the real QPU, we used another one. And I think that that affects the parameter in some kind of way that we weren't able to figure out in time for this presentation. Um, so. Uh, Actually, yeah, we can see that it doesn't converge. While if we if we uh, we made also the same plot for the classical for the simulation, and we and we saw that like actually the loss function the the energy is always like in this part of the graph. So uh, there were some problem I think due to the C not gate. Yeah. Testing. Okay. I was a little confused on this plot. Uh, so is one the simulator and one is the actual device? Because one says noise and one says... No, no, no. Okay, yeah. Uh, this was like to... We ran two simulation on the quantum, C, uh, quantum processor and uh, uh, you can actually set some uh, special parameter, some parameters with the simulation with, on the QPU to reduce the noise or not. And so we tried them both. First, actually, uh, mostly as a mistake, because we didn't see that there were tunable parameters. So we tried with, with noise and without noise. And we see, yeah, that uh, this signal is more clear than this. But yeah, we, uh, this is the main difference between the two. The two OK, blocks. thanks. That, that clears it up. That's going to be team seven now, average dodo enjoyers working on a cryptography use case.
and stuff when like do stuff whenever they stop you. Yeah. Testing. Hello. I need to do this. I need to time. So, where is the uh, presentation? Slideshow? So, one at a time. Okay. Yeah. So how do I uh, present? Um, and if they ask questions, are you able to lap? Okay, if you want to have a pointer, then use that on So I can change the slide with uh, with this. Yes. Yeah. Forward, previous, top one for pointing. Okay. Uh, okay, it's not mirror the screen. You can. Okay. Yes, we need to go back. Because it's not me. Yes. Then I do present. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for being here. We are a team Average Dodo enjoyers uh, with our challenge about uh, quantum cryptography. The, the presentation will follow the follow the, these steps. Uh, uh, we'll first have a brief introduction <coughs> about uh, cybersecurity. Uh, particularly in the energy sector, uh, and then, uh, uh, and, and then uh, talk about the, uh, the advantages of using quantum computing, and then we'll dive uh, into the challenge uh, with our solution. Okay, so as this data shows, the, um, the number of attacks uh, have been uh, steadily growing uh, in the last years, and uh, um, it is forecasted that uh, uh, the total amount, uh, uh, the total loss due to uh, cyber criminals will, will reach a, a trillion uh, by, by 2025. Um, the energy sector is uh, particularly affected by cyber criminals due to its uh, central role to the, to the world economy. Uh, so it is, uh, it is paramount for these companies to be up to date uh, when it comes uh, to cyber security. Um, quantum crypt uh, cryptography may, uh, may offer an help um, uh, and, and provide, uh, providing a, a powerful tool. Um, particularly, we, uh, we would like to, to use uh, quantum, crypto, uh, quantum computing to, um, to generate randomness. In fact, uh, classical, uh, classical way of uh, classical random number generators uh, are not really random. Um, and this may may pose a, uh, may pose a, um, 
uh, a vulnerability uh, that can be exploited. exploited. Uh, on the other hand, quantum, uh, quantum computers and quantum systems and, uh, are inherently random. And uh, so, we, so we would like to, uh, to leverage this, uh, this randomness for our scopes. Unfortunately, uh, due to the sensitivity of these, uh, of these systems, uh, noise may disrupt, noise caused uh, both by, either by uh, the environment or an adversarial attack, uh, may, uh, may disrupt the, this, uh, this randomness we want to, to create. I'll leave the word to my teammate. Um, yeah. So now that we've seen a bit about the context, uh, let's see what the arch, let's dive into the challenge that we had. So quantifying randomness in a noisy quantum circuit. So we uh, provide um, the randomness, the random numbers with a quantum circuit that is noisy and we try to see uh, how this noisiness affects the, um, the randomness of the numbers. Um, so first things first, why, uh, what is it uh, quantifying randomness, how do we do it? Uh, so we don't want just to generate something random, we actually want to be sure that uh, it is random and how random it is. So it is important in uh, cryptography, in quantum cryptography to actually like measure the randomness. So you're all th thinking uh, we do it with uh, Shannon entropy. Uh, the only problem is that uh, Shannon entropy can uh, overestimate the, the randomness of, uh, of what you uh, give it. So uh, we actually use here the minimum entropy. So you have the formula here, so it takes the worst case scenario. And so that actually interests us uh, for cryptography because we want to know what can happen in the worst case scenario. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so what can we get as a maximum, uh, maximum random um, uh, state? Um, we, we want to just a uniform distribution, of course. So we do that with um, just all Hadamard's in a circuit, since we're doing uh, it with quantum circuits. Um, so we were given to test uh, the noise a, a toy model. Um, so we, okay, we actually had the code of the, of the toy model, uh, to, which provides the noise, but uh, we, I mean, we just say that it's a black box and that we tried a few circuits to see how it uh, reacted to it. So first, if we feed it to um, completely like a, the circuits are supposed to provide a uniform distribution. So for example, a whole uh, Adamard circuit, we can see up uh, here what it does when it's, uh, there's no noise and then when we apply the noise. So we see that there's a little difference though. Um, and then we tried with a different circuit that is also supposed to provide a uniform distribution, um, but that is different, so the noise should maybe act differently on it. Uh, and we can sort of see that, it's, uh, that it does act differently on it, that uh, this is actually like the noisy part of this is less noisy than the, than the first one. Yes, so we have uh, the, the yeah, we had the min entropy. Uh, we just didn't really put it in for some reason, but we do have these uh, somewhere in the code. So uh, the previous graph don't seems like uh, to be uh, if, uh, there, there. It seems like uh, there is no difference between uh, the results. Uh, from the all Adamar circuits and the Adamar and uh, C not gate circuits affected by the noise in the previous graph. There is no differences. So, and that's what, and that's, uh, is not what we expected to see. Now I will tell why we doesn't expect that. So, we studied the noise model and uh, uh, reading the the, the code, we figure out uh, how the, uh, the noise model works. And uh, all what, is that, all what it, it does is to uh, nullify the effect of the last single qubit gate for each single qubit. And the probability of doing that is par uh, parameterized by the 
parameter lambda, and, uh, and this is what we figured out. But uh, so, so the gates that are not single qubit but are multiple, multiple qubit. Sorry, can, can I ask you a question? I'm a bit confused. So, yes. You have, at the beginning, you have a circuit which just generates a random uh, string. Yes. Uniformly distributed, okay. ideally. Okay. So, with probability one over two to the n, I get one of these. Mm. And it's enough to have other marked gates. Yes, it's enough. But then you started talking about noise. Okay. Then we what apply a noise model to the circuits. And what the, the toys model does, uh, after uh, we figure out, figure out what the toys model does, by studying uh, experiments and also reading the code the, of the toy model. Okay. And uh, you, have you seen that the results, the previous results, uh, from the whole Adamart circuits with the noise, and, okay, uh, now, the just a second. The, the C not gates that connect the, 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 the okay. qubits to, to C down okay. here, what, what are they, what do we, why do you need them? Okay, these, are, these the whole Hadamard circuits and the uh, circuit with Hadamard and C not are two different circuits that, that, that generate a uniform distribution, but are different circuits. So we want to see how the noise model affect these two uh, type of, of circuits okay. and see the differences. Okay, I see. Why we... And, and the... Uh, so the... Uh, this is the Adam and Okay, the is. ancillas are just to reading out the qubits. Yes, the, the, okay. the classical re okay, resistor. So that too. symbol is just a measure. Yes, of okay. course. Very good. So... All right. So now you, you have a noise model for your gates. So the gates are imperfect in some sense. The toys model is a black box. We don't know. We, uh, the toys model is uh, implemented in, uh, in order to uh, have a, a, mod, a noise that uh, uh, you don't know where the noise uh, comes from. In, the noise can, can, be, can be come from, from the single gate measure, measurement, okay. uh, the, the single gate itself, the, from the preparation of the state, from the, from the, measure, from the me measurement. Uh, and so the toy, the toy model is a black box that uh, will ruin your results stops. So, of course, there, there is uh, it, it, who, who write the code that uh, implement the toy model uh, want to uh, also um, um, simulate the gate error, but it's not the only error. The toy model, uh, uh, the toy model is a black box that will only run, runs the results of our circuits independently of the type of noise. It's a black box. But, uh, so, what we study, the experiments, and we, uh, and we uh, read the code, and uh, we figure out how, the, how this toy model works, and the effect is to nullify the last single qubit gate for each single qubit, and the probability of doing that is uh, uh, lambda, okay? So when lambda, uh, when the noise is applied, is applied to all the qubit simultaneously. So you can figure out that uh, you can uh, 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 avoid this noise by applying, for example, two C naught to the same qubit that will result in, a, in identity, but uh, then the circuit will not be affected by the noise because the toy model is this this toy model uh, this toy noise model is quite easy. Uh, an example of, uh, of a circuit that will not affect by this toy model, toy noise model, is the GHZ state for three qubits. And uh, we call, so we call this, this type for, of uh, um, gates, uh, Gandalf gate, because the noise will not pass from that point on, on the circuit. So this is Gandalf. So the, the, the C not act as a, a barrier. Uh, so, why higher res our results don't show differences between the two circuits, the circuit with whole Hadamard and circuit with Hadamard and Sinot? It's because the vanilla implementation of the, toys, uh, the noise model have lambda equal to 0 0.5. Uh, and uh, if we uh, improve the model by changing the value of, of lambda, we, uh, uh, imp we uh, will raise up the probability of applying the noise, and we maybe we'll see the, 
the, uh, a better uh, the distinguish between uh, the, the first circuits and the second one. Uh, um, sorry, and, uh, but uh, what we have done is not only this, we have also improved the, 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 toy, the, mod, the model noise, the noise model by uh, added, adding the feature that uh, will, uh, will uh, uh, add a probability uh, of applying the noise that is independent for each single qubit. Now, in the graph, that is the last thing that uh, I will uh, tell to you because I have to pass the, the yes, of course. Okay, uh, the, the graph, this is a graph that will show the re uh, experimental results. The orange dots are the experimental results of the, of the circuit with Adamard and c -naught. Yes, so Adamard and c -naught. but there are, uh, we have a big question, so go. Adamard c uh, circuits with Hadamard and c are the dotted, c dotted circuits, uh, dotted, uh, line, uh, the dotted line, and the, line, the red line is the results of the circuit with the, all, uh, the, all the Hadamard, and you can see that the, the, the circuits with the, the c knots have a lower bound to the uh, entropy, and that is good, no? That is good because uh, uh, this is uh, useful to, the, to our task, yeah, to have a lower bound to the minimal entropy, okay? The, minimal, the worst case scenario, the minimal entropy. Have a lower bound is really good. Uh, prego. Uh, I'll be very, very quick. So, um, how do we change the thing? Uh, where do I have to point it? From? Uh, <laughs> Can I ask this some help from someone? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. What is this? Yeah, yeah we're, we're trying, we're trying, we're trying. Come on. Come on, what's going on? He's dying, the computer is dying. Uh, uh, can you change the... <laughs> uh, because <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm trying to go. Uh, technical difficulties apart. Wow. Okay. Wow. Quantum computer. Yes. Um, my friend is taking her PC, so maybe we can look at the presentation. Even though the photo is very cute. Okay, now it's working. Perfect. This one. So I'll be very, very, I will be very, very quick. So um, what we talked about so far was uh, the first part of the challenge. Now we go into like a theoretical point of view and we assume that there is not a toy model. There is whatever circuit we want as a, as, a, as a noise model. So how things change? We have to look at the worst case scenario because in cryptography that's everything that matters, only that. So um, if we have any circuit ever that implements any state, which is U, exists a lambda such that epsilon, which is the gate of the noise, uh, undoes what U does. So what does that mean? H min is zero because we only have one state. And that's not good. So um, single circuit approach is not enough. We cannot hope to find the circuit that is perfect. 
what, we, what people do is uh, um, take random circuits and make this certificate protocol, which is based on the Bell's inequality. Uh, the, the general approach is quite difficult. We implemented it on uh, the simpler case, which is um, as you, we take the GHZ state, which is HC0, and then we take as uh, um, local measurements for the first qubit, one between x, x and z randomly, and for Bob, which is the second qubit, we take x or z, but um, followed by a rotation on the y-axis, parameterized by theta. Um, so what we do, we measure after that, we post-process the statistics, and we build the estimator, which is C, which is a function of the uh, expectation values. And we have two, two bounds. Classical bound is two, quantum bound is two square root of two. So if we have C that is plus, um, greater than two, we are happy because we are carrying some entropy. Uh, we cannot go um, uh, greater than two square root of two, it, that's the maximum, and it's, it carries one bit of entropy. So um, JHZ is a good state, but uh, because it's, um, it's easy to implement, but uh, it doesn't take the maximum entropy, it only takes one bit of entropy, even though it's made of n qubit. So what we do, uh, we check that uh, Bell's inequality are violated. If they are violated, we take the measurements. So we have a string that is uh, uh, the output of this circuit, this device. Then we have to use a randomness extractor to search between all the string and between the garbage find that bit of entropy which is truly random. So we, we will have as an output of the, random, of the randomness extractor a shorter string, but it, that will be truly random. Um, we use randomness extractor from uh, quantum origin product, which is uh, developed by Quantinum, and I have to stress two things. The first is that this approach is device independent because we didn't ac assume anything on the noise model. The second thing is that although the second part of the challenge is theoretically motivated, we actually implemented the randomness extractor. So we actually used the package. We can take a string from the device, put into extractor, and have a shorter string, which is random. Okay, uh, so super quick, I will just skip maybe this and do a direct to our example. We used uh, a case in which the uh, cheese H, uh, okay, inequality are filled, fulfilled, and we see that uh, we have one bit every two bits of information, and that's what we see. We take our random string that violates perfectly the GSH inequality. We pass it to the random noise extractor and we get four bits. From a string that should have four, but one every two, we get four bits of random information. And that's it. That's our GitHub. We want to thank uh, our mentor, Continuum, and the SCTP for providing the challenge and organizing this event. And thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry for the time. So you said in, in there that you, this is kind of a device independent approach in the sense that you don't need to know about the noise model that, that the machine uses. But um, here you're running on a simulator and you produce some bits that we, we kind of call random because you violated the bound. So, but obviously no true randomness in the generator because you ran on a simulator. So what do you think, what's wrong with that? When, when I say it's completely device independent, what, what kind of assumption do we add? Uh, we assume that like this, the way that we choose the measurement, we are assuming it's completely random, but it must come from somewhere. So it's uh, like, it's not truly random in that sense. So we must take uh, a starting key that has some, like I explained it here, uh, like a bit there. We need to start with a starting key, which has some randomness, and we assume that the key is random. Yes. But we don't know for sure. But you see, you ran it on a simulator, so there's no way, we, there's no non-determinism in the quantum sense. So, uh, yeah, so here? yeah, because we ran it on, didn't run it on a real machine. Yeah, yeah. like this is a simplified version of it. Mm -hmm. Like in this case, it's very easy to study, but uh, in theory, we should, if we take our quantum, like JSH uh, yeah. estimators, 
if they were violated, we should be able to tell that the bits were getting out at random. This is an easy case to study because we know the rotation is only in one bit, so it's only one parameter to change. But if we could create a completely random circuit, we know that the chase age uh, inequality is violated. Our bit, what we're getting out, is truly random. It's quantum. I think I think essentially what I'm trying to say, you still need to assume that the the thing that you're running on is still trying to implement a quantum computer. You can't just use a simulator. Like that's the missing part of the assumption. So it's kind of what we call like a semi-device independent approach. But yes. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, we, we thought that some lights were like super quick, but we yeah. actually didn't. <laughs> can start preparing already. <laughs> Sorry, there is a phone here. Can the next team already set up?
the true microphone? Uh, it's mirrored, so you can see. Uh, it's starting now. The floor is yours. Good morning to all. Uh, so the name of our team is Tiki Taka Tiki Ticket, and uh, we uh, <laughs> and we would like to have like special. Uh, we would like to give special thanks to Callum because he had to invest a lot with us. And also to Luca, he was not our mentor, but he helped us a lot. And uh, so this was our first quantum experiment, or you say <laughs> quantum uh, project that we guys did. We are from MHPC team. And so the title of our uh, presentation is Tifoli Decomposition for uh, Grover or Oracle. So. So we did the Tifoli decomposition using a blog post, and uh, then we compared with the one with Ticket, and then we uh, we had to write an oracle from scratch, and then we had to do the Grover's algorithm. So the thing that motivated us that multi-control gates they must be compiled to single and two qubit gates before executing quantum algorithms on real devices because it's difficult to implement. Uh, uh, multi-control gates in backend, so we had to decompose them using single qubits and uh, two qubit system. And then there's an efficient implementation of algorithm depends on optimizing optimizing the decomposition of multi-control gates. And so if we are not able to optimize it nicely, then we we need to increase number of gates, which can uh, which can lead to more noise. And so and ev even the depth will, of the circuit increases. So the real life application that we guys also did was writing an oracle and uh, doing the implementation in Grover's algorithm. And so we were more focused, like we had two parts. The first part was more focused on optimizing, optimizing the Tifoli gates. And the second was on writing oracle and implementing on Grover's algorithm. So the task was divided into two categories. One was like optimizing uh, the decomposition of Tifoli gates using Craig's black, uh, blog post, which was suggested by Callum. And the second one was finding a nice and smart oracle to implement in Grover's algorithm. So, so we had to start with like doing the decomposition on using pen and paper. Then we did the classical approach using Encilia bits using the same crack, uh, cracks blog post. And then we did the quantum approach where we use uh, like we use the quantum circuit simulations as like uh, root n, which like, and then we compared the implementation with ticket. So we proceed with our first approach. So first we did with the uh, classical Encyla uh, approach, and then we found that like it was leading to more, num more qubits, which was contributing more noise. So we had to go to the quantum approach, where we took the operations as uh, root n for quantum circuits. And so what we divided, uh, what we did is uh, like uh, breaking the n controls into sub-controls, and so the subcontrols they have uh, less, uh, like the subprocess they have less controls, and uh, and we recursively uh, implement uh, uh, the function again and again, which leads to less number of uh, gates and which leads to less noise. And so uh, this is this was the result that what we could implement was first was the one that we can see on the left uh, was the implementation of the blog post where we could see that this is a this is an intermediate step that we could implement for a two cubic system uh, and the depth of the circuit seems to be five and the number of gates in the circuit total used using the blog post was five and the node gates that we could find were two. And this was an intermediate uh, intermediate step and after that like 
Uh, this one was with the ticket, which was like uh, decomposition with ticket. So if you, if, if you have less number of qubits, then this, this seems to be fine. But if your gate is like um, you have more number of qubits, and it's like, then it's, it, it becomes more complicated because you have more qubits. So it's easy to decompose in the form of uh, this approach. Um, So now that we have, op okay, <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. So now that we have um, optimized the, the gates, we would like to apply it to a real problem, and it was suggested to solve the traveling salesman problem on a quantum computer. So as you know, the traveling salesman problem, you have a bunch of cities connected in some way, and you want to visit each city once and only once. Now, what you can do is a brute force search, you can just do all paths and check if the path exists and if it is a path that visits each city once and only once. And being a brute force search, uh, it's very amenable to put on a quantum computer using Grover's algorithm. So Grover's algorithm um, gives you in a brute force search problem like, for example, uh, the traveling salesman problem, a, quadrat a quadratic speed up respect to the classical brute force search. And what you need to do for this is you have one oracle which tells you, you give it a path, and it tells you if the path is good or it's not. And then you have the amplification or the diffuser. Okay, I went too far. So the difficult part here is to build uh, the oracle because the diffuser is basically the same for any Grover's algorithm. And to build the oracle, you need to build, uh, classically, it's very simple. You give it a path, it checks if the path is good, and if it's good, that's it. If no, it says no. But now you need to implement this on a quantum circuit using unitary gates and doing it all by hand, only with Toffoli gates. It's a complete disaster because how do you check uh, that a path exists, that is good, you need to input the graph that you have for the cities. It's terrible. Uh, so what do you do? You just do it, and this is the circuit you get. So this is the circuit you get for, in this case, four cities that you want to visit. And this is just the oracle. Then you pr plug it into the diffuser, and uh, you have your Grover's algorithm. If you want to do it for five cities, uh, to simulate all the qubits, you need about a terabyte of RAM. So we couldn't do it. The graph. Uh, whatever you want. Yes. So the graph impacts the circuit itself, the connectivity of the circuit. So this one is for uh, basically a square. Four, four cities and connected like this. So depending on your graph, you get a different circuit. Yes. Any graph. Any, any you want. So the number of qubits is the same for any graph. The graph itself just implements, I mean, just impacts the connections we have. Number of qubits is just the number of No, no. I don't know. <laughs> Probably one of the last ones. But OK, anyway, so once we have this, you can. Anyway, uh, once you have this, you can optimize it using the optimization they described before, and then plug it into the diffuser and you have your Grover's algorithm. Uh, 
maybe if you you can tell him some details about. Yeah, basically, what you want to do, as Ben was uh, saying, is uh, you want to, to check all paths at once. So you want to take, take uh, all the possible paths between, uh, let's say, four vertices that pass through all the city. And first, you want to put uh, to encode this path. So the way we do it uh, is um, each city corresponds to some number. And uh, the idea was first to basically extract uh, the number of the city from a bit representation implemented with qubit. So extract uh, the number of the cities and then create all the paths. So some of these paths will just not fit in the graph because some edge. Okay, I, have, I have a problem with this. Yeah. The problem is a conversational problem with the following problem. I have a graph in which graph is fixed. Yes. Vertices are the cities. Let's say something like this. For example, something like that. So, and uh, you can also weight with the length of the. Okay, we just consider the equal weights. Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry, maybe we're uh, talking about uh, different problems because uh, we are not looking for a, a minimizer of the paths, okay. but just of the existence of a path connecting all the cities. Yes, and I'm in path. Yes, exactly. Okay. So just that the I'm... Is not a path. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we didn't go, we haven't we had, had time to go to the minimization uh, part uh, and putting all the weights, but... That is a, is a bit tricky, so we discussed with uh, our mentors, and uh, it's not that you, you can really minimize once you assign a, a weight to all of these, because it's, uh, it's quite difficult to do on a, on a quantum device. So what you should do is maybe put uh, some threshold and check that we can do, and check if uh, this graph, uh, uh, is the weight assigned to this graph uh, is less or more than this threshold. And so you can isolate the paths uh, which have a a weight less than your threshold. But to find the actual minimum, uh, I don't think it's so, possible. So your this problem way. is the amino. Yes, yes. But uh, with the goal of, goal of travel. Uh, no, the amino effect is an empty computer. Yes, it's already something, right? <laughs> so it's uh, not an easy problem. Yes. Um, so we have five minutes of questions, a bit less actually, four minutes. Yeah. Um, can Luca ask a question, is that fine? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about um, when you compare the decompositions. Um, if you go on the decomposition slide, yes. you, you compare your decomposition with ticket. Can you maybe tell me a bit more what you, what you take away from this? comparison you're making here? So, uh, th this, this one is not the comparison, but like uh, it's an intermediate step that we could do with that blo uh, blog post, and then we have to apply the uh, decomposition that we, that with ticket one, because we couldn't finish this problem. So okay, yeah. yeah. Because the, the problem here is that you com you're comparing apples with pears, right? Because the, the, the gates you're using on the left they're more powerful than the gates using on the right. Yes. So we so. Once they have only top leaf. So these are the top leaves that we need to decompose into the other single qubit gates. Okay. Sure. Hello. Um, first, can we leave all questions at the end for the speakers, please? Um, so the, the intuition on the, the circuit, can you give me some insight there? How does that reflect the graph? Yeah. Uh, so maybe I, I'm going in the wrong direction. Yes. Yes. Uh, so maybe I can just sketch uh, briefly what we are doing. So basically we have uh, like three, four sets. Of, uh, of qubits. So as I was saying, uh, first of all, you want to uh, represent each city in a bitwise. bitwise. So basically, you, okay, the, the number of cities is given from the beginning. 
so you can bound the, the bit you need. And basically, you just check one by one with some thin of gates. Either uh, this CP is the corresponds to the number zero, if the, the bit string corresponds to the number zero, then you invert some of these qubits. This will uh, correspond to the number maybe one, and you keep doing some inversion, and basically, you assign to each to each city the corresponding number in decimal notations, let's say. Yeah, so basically you have uh, some qubits, or some uh, set of qubits, representing uh, all the cities. And uh, to each of these, uh, you will uh, have uh, uh, as many as as the number of the cities. Yeah. And uh, with these, uh, sorry? Yeah. Sorry, can you hear? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can be very precise with the number of qubits. It's uh, something like... Uh, 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 n squared plus uh, n log n plus yeah, some yeah. constant. So basically, in this way, you will shoot just one of the ancilla, which will be the one corresponding to the exact number of the city for each city. In this way, you can identify basically uh, which number uh, which number are you, you are looking at. So of all these ancilla, just one of these will be shot and will be the identifier for the number of the city. So this is just for uh, uh, for encoding one path. And the first, the first thing you want to check is that this path is Hamiltonian, so that pass through every city. So what you want to ask is that for the ancillary number S0, 1, etc., for all the ancillary number S0, there's exactly one that, is, uh, that has been shot. That is exactly one that has been shot for the ancillary number S1. So you can do it uh, with a with sin of gate as well and uh, save the result in some ancillary ancilla. So you will need... Uh, another n of qubits. So at this point, you just isolated uh, all the Hamiltonian paths from your uh, uh, bit strings. But now you want to check that they can actually fit uh, your graph. And, uh, and this you can do just looking at the adjacency matrix. So the adjacency matrix is your input. This is just classical, just a, a small matrix. And basically, you check for, a, okay, for example, this one, uh, maybe something like this. I'm going, am I going out of time? Basically, you check uh, all the edges that, uh, are, uh, that uh, are present in the path, and you try to connect uh, the two cities uh, with the edge. And so this will uh, isolate uh, all the, the paths that can fit in the graph. And basically, these are, in this are you need uh, some uh, other edges to, to cover. Uh, yeah, sorry, some uh, other uh, ancilla qubit uh, that correspond to the uh, edges. So now, one side you've checked that the path is Hamiltonian. On the other side, you've checked that the path actually fits in the graph. And then you just uh, put a synod gate between these two checks, and uh, you actually get if the path exists or not. Yes, a lot of synods, yes, which are then solved by the okay. GERS team. Uh, uh, okay, one but very quick question and very quick answer, please. <laughs> Greg Gidney's brain or not? Sorry again? Did you, did you compile better than uh, Greg Gidney or not? Uh, so we, we compiled the circuit on, uh, on PTEC, on, on uh, Ticket, and uh, it works. I mean, better it, than Greg's? Uh, better than? No, then, no, we didn't check that. Uh, great. The, the, the answer the is. Paper you heard. No, no, we, we haven't no. checked that. I mean, we haven't, we haven't checked the path, uh, the, the timing it, um, versus uh, the, the time favor of the rate. Okay, all good. Thank you very much. You. Next team, Team 10.
it's it's here. Uh, okay. But uh, there is no uh, full screen. It's not showing the. Five minutes. Oh, at five and eight, I guess. Five, five and eight would be the day. Okay. Yes. for pointing, right? Yes. This So hello everyone, we are Team 10 and we are Team uh, Call for Krilov if you're into Call of Duty. And we worked on quantum Krilov methods to find out grounds, uh, energies of molecules. And we were mentored by Nathan Fitzpatrick from uh, Quantinium. Uh, so since we're working with finding the uh, energies of molecules, we will need a Hamiltonian to begin. So for, uh, we used uh, our Hamiltonian for hydrogen molecule. And we had uh, second quantized harmonic Hamiltonian. And then we used uh, uh, in quanta from Quantinium to uh, convert it to our weighted combination of Pauli's. That is basically the qubit uh, encoding. Uh, so we will also need a reference state. For us, it's a simple reference state of 1100 ket that we get from the circuit of two simple uh, NOT gates. Then, so this is our uh, quantum subspace Krilov method, right? So as you can see, basically it's a hybrid algorithm where you use the classical portion here uh, to calculate the eisenvalue problem, and we use to populate the matrices from F and A, uh, so the H matrix and S matrix using the quantum computer. So basically, as you see from the uh, equations here, and uh, eigenvector here, it's the, the eigenvector for the usual standard problem is 2n into 1, right? And for, uh, for a quantum subspace, you, you divide it into subspace, so you have, an, you have a much smaller subspace of m into 1. So here m is significantly lo lower than 2n, right? So you, you, you already can guess the advantage here. So, and also for the novelty of our approach, we are the, the, um, the uh, method we're implementing are quite new. It's both of the papers in, uh, 2022 and it's 2023, so you can see there aren't many, too many references or tutorials lying around for us to play with, so it's quite novel. Uh, so basically, um, as you can see, finding the energies is a generalized eigenvalue problem uh, that, that we solve for HC equals to ESC, where H is the Hamiltonian, C is the eigenvector, and S being the overlap matrix, and from E we get the energies of the uh, molecules we are looking for. So these scales is combinatorial scaling, but Krilov methods are found around this, uh, around this scaling. So for the Krilov subspace method, we have two inputs of H and S, and we get the outputs of E and C, where uh, we use the uh, E for finding the eigenvalues, right? So Krilov method is basically a linear combi weighted linear combination of, of the uh, function, powers of function of H applied to our reference state, that is psi not kept, right? Uh, then if you see, we use that power of function of H and use it for time evolution. So we, we need both real time, uh, time evolution and imaginary time evolution. So as you can see, for the standard Krilov, we get the, well, we measure expectation values of both H Hamiltonian matrix and the overlap matrix. And the difference between the two matrices are basically in uh, H you have the Hamiltonian and S you don't have the Hamiltonian. That's, yes. Yeah, we generate a subspace, yeah. Hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, that's what the unitary unitary flow method. We will be getting that to our next slides. It's it's included in our slides. So we are talking about standard flow method, and the unitary flow method is for the quantum computers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the exponential looks better on quantum computer. We will get so, to sorry. Yeah, we will get to unitary cryolog in the next yeah. slide. So you, you apply unitary flow methods for quantum computers, but standards is for classical solvers. Okay. Uh, so as we can see, uh, the complexity shifts to ma matrix element calculations. So that's our old th difficult thing. And from the um, previous slide, the, uh, the M and N are the indices of the elements of the matrices. So we are calculating the matrix elements. And so the indices are the powers of our, uh, of the function of our H, right? And you can see here, the this is the unitary flow which we implement on the quantum computer. And as we can see, it significantly reduces the number of elements compared to the standard flow. As we can see in the next slide, uh, we also use, we use this error view, so it helps us to like, visualize what's happening and also the dimensions of the operators that we're using. And we can see that since we are uh, exponentiating the Hamiltonian, the number of elements are lower. And that, that's what we wanted to show with this error view, a pictorial intuitive view to see the advantage. Uh, and this is the uh, overlap matrix S. And you can also see the, uh, how, how the dimensions there are. And, we, and as, as I mentioned before, there is, not, there is no Hamiltonian in the uh, S matrix. And we uh, now also see how the Krilov basis actually uh, uh, is portrayed uh, pictorially uh, with, uh, with the evolution operators, that is the functions of uh, H to the power on the reference state, psi naught. And then we get psi 1, psi 2, and we add them up. So it's uh, linear, uh, weighted linear combinations of the Krilov basis, psi naught, psi 1, psi 2, right? And you can see how those operates and how the boxes of the time evolution scales with the powers. And we get the powers from the indices of the or matrix, right? So as we said, it's a time evolution operator, right? So we, get, we need both real and uh, imaginary time evolution operator. And for our case, we use totalization method. So for totalization method, you basically uh, get slices of the time and you uh, operate them co consecutively on, on one after another. And uh, to get the uh, trotter steps, each of the trotter steps uh, we get from our Hamiltonian itself. So you have H alpha, P alpha summation, right? So for each H alpha, P alpha, you get one time slice. And you apply them on. So you actually get the time slices depends on the number of terms in the Hamiltonian, the Pauli matrices, right? So, then. Uh, and so to calculate the uh, expected values, which is the Hadamard test, and this is uh, important because we can get the real and the imaginary Hadamard values depending on the phase gate W we have here. So for imaginary uh, expectation value, we apply uh, an S phase. And for the real expectation value, we don't apply uh, a phase gate at all. Uh, the, here is just uh, how we get the counts. And you can see that, the, for, uh, that we can get the elements by applying these uh, equations that should get us the real, expect, the real and imaginary expected values. And when we add them up together uh, with, a fact, with a phase factor, that we get the, the result that we want. So this is a, uh, for the simulator. And for exponentiating, which I, uh, I think is uh, kind of the most important part of the, of the project, we use a poly gadget. So this imp circuit implements uh, an, exponential, uh, an exponential function that uh, it has uh, some that has a poly string in its uh, in its parameter. So this is uh, the, circ the circuit primitive, and uh, you can see how we use basis changes depending on the gates that we want to that we have in our uh, poly string. And this is the one that we made in Ticket. So in Ticket, there's a function called uh, poly exp uh, poly exp that uh, well like, sorry poly xbox that uh, allows you to do this, this circuit, but we made our, our own routine. So this circuit we made ourselves, and this is just one case for a specific polystring. We, since we have a linear combination of polystrings, of exponential polystrings, sorry, we have to make a, a poly gadget for each one and then uh, append them. And you can see that our poly gadget is equivalent to using the poly exponential box, which 
you would use in quantum in, with a quantum control box, uh, which is would be used for a control unitary in the Hadamard test circuit, but the top three steps are done can be done by tickets. But our approach is more uh, is uh, yeah, it's it's significantly uh, simpler because we just made the circuit specific for our for our problem. Uh, you can see how for a Krylov's uh, depth three for the uh, Ket three for or Ket two for example, we just apply the 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 circuit uh, three times. So this is just uh, for visual, uh, easy visualization. We also compiled it uh, using tickets uh, inbuilt com in compi circuit compiler to reduce the, to remove some redundancies that might arise in the in the circuit. And you can see how we had the Hadamard tests here in order to perform the Hadamard test. So for throttleization, we just, well, this is uh, what I uh, explained previously. Uh, there's a, quite a difference uh, between our circuit and the, this is due to the indices being uh, from top to bottom. So we start at zero at top and then uh, at the bottom. And in, these indices start uh, from zero at the bottom and they go, it just uh, flips the circuit. But uh, you can see how the scaling of this uh, is kind of a, a bit harder to do. Uh, the scaling has nothing to do with Krylov, it's more with the totalization algorithm. So if there's a, with the phase estimation algorithm. So it, uh, the number of qubit gates, it corresponds to 2n plus 1, uh, where n is the number of polyterms in one element of the qubit Hamiltonian. It's the number of uh, the Pauli string. Uh, this is just the worst case because there are Hamiltonians, uh, there are terms in the Hamiltonian that don't, in, that don't include uh, all the qubits for the Pauli string. So for example, in this one we have uh, three, uh, uh, poly matrices, or well, in this one we have four, uh, but this is just one uh, case where it's, uh, every every polygate is used. Okay, so to compare our results, we used exact diagonalization, and since this were a, was a sparse matrix, it was a kind of a very useful thing to to do, and it, uh, not really costly to to simulate. But this is not really the point. This is just a comparison for the eigenstate and the various excited states of uh, H2 molecule. Uh, we did a sci-fi approximation. Uh, I will talk about uh, some of the problems with, uh, that we arose here, but basically we tried to use sci-fi to do the exponentiation of the matrices. Uh, this is uh, how fast they converged. So depending on the trotter, classical trotter length, uh, we can, uh, you can see how the, the interatomic distance varies. This is the derivative plot for the eigenstate. So each point here, is the final uh, eigenstate that it has converged to, and you can see the, how fast uh, it tries to converge using SciPy. Again, this is just uh, for simulation. We also used a variational quantum eigensolver in order to try to approximate a better state than our 1100 uh, ansatz. Uh, we run, and we ran it in, in quanto backend and uh, noisy in quanto uh, backend as well. Uh, however, for the summary, we see that the, well, we have here the exact uh, eigenvalues. And now for using 1100 as an ansatz, using SciPy, uh, we got uh, one excited state for free. This, we had some problems with the uh, dependence of the H matrices. So there were uh, some sort of issues that arose that the matrices were not uh, really Hermitian and uh, like that depends on the subspace. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll wrap it, I will wrap it up. Sorry, this uh, has to supposed to be a minus one. We didn't really get a, a correct result using a quantum uh, simulation. We think it's because of the trotter code that they didn't really implement uh, correctly, but this is more of a, yeah, I, I explained it here. It's more of a future step, so we could fix the trotter and aim, um, and aim to get the comparable results to SciPy and the traditional VQE results. And uh, you can see that this is the qubit Hamiltonian that we originally get. And we tried to get like a, a section in using Krylov method, but uh, it uh, kind of failed uh, in the quantum implementation and in the SciPy implementation as well. Uh, it, this has something to do with the Krylov space symmetries and that the, per self, uh, the, the symmetry preserving nature of the time, imaginary and real time evolution operators. Uh, these were the references that we used and uh, we would like to really thank our mentor, Nathan Fitzpatrick and ICTP and, and continue. Yes, uh, if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Um,
priority to the jury for questions, and if um, they have none, then the public can also take some. Two minutes for questions. We can go back to the, the question you asked before, or? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat? Uh, I can't, uh, couldn't get it before. Oh, I, um, I don't remember it. Anymore. It was something about the function with the exponentiation, right? Yeah, yeah, so I was talking about, uh, exactly, but, but then you diverted a lot from there, so I'm not sure that's sorry. an issue anymore. So. In some sense, on a classical computer, you you don't do the Krilov method with f of h, which is more than a low order polynomial, because simply that is, yes. you know, the, so you apply you apply h on a vector, and the gain is in the fact that when you apply h to a, a vector, you get a vector which is not it does not, uh, you know, it's it's in a particular subspace. Okay. Okay. Uh, and um, if h, if you take i powers of h, and this is due to the fact that h is sparse. Mm -hmm. So typical physical h's are sparse because there is locality because of everything. I mean, it's difficult to have an h which is fully connected in, in real physics uh, examples. Uh, and um, which is a dense matrix, okay, I was thinking about a graph. Um, but what, what you're doing here with Krilov on a quantum computer is, is more like phase estimation in some sense. Yes, the you're Using the fact that e to the minus i h t on a quantum computer is a natural thing. Yeah, it's, it's uh, like we have to propagate uh, exactly. the thing. And the use of unitary Krylov is that we don't have to do this uh, matrix multiplication as with standard Krylov. Exactly. So we can just put it inside the exponential, uh, the phase and, and those terms. Uh, so for a quantum computer, probably h to the fourth would be also a difficult thing to do. Yes. Uh, some of the <laughs> is either h or e to the minus i h t. I think some of our references in here like uh, outline H4 uh, and H6, and they do outline that uh, it becomes somewhat uh, difficult for the, for the quantum computer. But uh, the main, uh, I think the main uh, like future work could be done into a phase estimation algorithm instead of using uh, the Krylov method. The Krylov method I th uh, offers, like we found out that it offers a significant advantage in combining the classical and quantum approach yes. because you have a smaller basis, you have a smaller matrix to diagonalize. But uh, yes, as yes, you can see, it's pretty new research. But uh, we hope to continue on with the with the project. We liked it. Uh, we, we like it very much. Okay. I have maybe just a brief question. Uh, you mentioned that you used a ticket. I'm not necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not okay. a ticket person, so I'm not necessarily fishing for endorsement. Uh, but um, did, I was just curious, how much did that? Do you know how much that uh, helped optimize the the circuit? We tried. Yeah, quick, quick question. Uh, we couldn't really get uh, some quantum, like the matrices you see here are not, uh, like they're so dependent that we couldn't like, get an estimate for the quantum uh, approach. But we tried using compilers and, and not compiling the gates and we couldn't really find an advantage. Like it did uh, very f so fast, the optimization that we didn't really find an, uh, an advantage in the, like, in the computation time per se. But for the results, we cannot say if one is, if they compile, if it compiled correctly or if it didn't compile correctly because uh, we didn't get uh, good results that approximated the sci-fi simulation. So. Yes, yes, we, uh, it's hand-coded, so. Yeah, PyTicket did, did compile uh, some of the things, but the circuits were, became so large that uh, we just uh, couldn't really like even include them in, in the presentation. Good, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Team 15, Quantum Firecats.
Uh, so you have the pointer. <coughs> the bottom point. Uh, you have a speaker. I do. Okay. <laughs> okay. You need to change the slider with the uh, oh, okay. key. Okay. Okay, good morning everyone. I hope don't be so tired right now. Okay, we are the uh, Team 15 and we are Quantum Firecats. Our project uh, consists in quantum error uh, correction and our mentor was uh, Dr. Ben Kreiger. Kreiger? Okay, sorry. Uh, our motivation, only in, uh, in quantum computing, we have a lot of errors, right? So we all the community put too much, too much effort to trying to fix these errors or compensate this, uh, these errors. If you, if we remember in the in the slices of error, we say the quantum computing have um, one error, an average one error per ten to the three hour operations. So this is a huge error because we have, we made a lot of computation. So uh, that is the motivation of this project. And as well, we increase the, in, uh, the confiability. If we put too much effort in this uh, quantum error uh, correction, we increase the confiability of the results of these algorithms. Okay, our main task the implement, uh, was the implementation of the optimal and efficient decoding of the concatenate quantum blocks using Python. And this is the, uh, the QR, QR code is the reference of we take it for implement this uh, quantum corrections. Okay, our main goal as well is to reproduce the following, uh, following results that we found in this, uh, re in this reference. Or the describe of the si uh, our system, it's we have five qubits and with different levels of concatenations. We explain uh, later what mean concatenations. And using a Monte Carlo sampling to, to generate these errors, and after that, uh, with difference, the polarization rates. And we try to get the same results for, no, we try to get the same results for probability of error, erroneous decoding. So with these uh, tools, we try to fix our problems, the main problems in quantum computing. And a spoiler, we replicate this data. Okay, this, this, uh, this uh, plot will explain uh, a little bit later. Okay, so, uh, Thank you, Alfredo. So imagine that we want to uh, apply this, uh, our implementation of the uh, most efficient and the optimal implementation of a decoder to solve the issue of having a noise, uh, having a message that uh, is subject to noise. Uh, imagine that Alice wants to talk with Bob. So Alice will send a message that is a quantum state, and we need, then the message passes to the encoder, then it will be subject to a noise, and then the decoder helps Bob to get the message. But we, we don't know if Bob will get the proper message or not, so the COVID information. We will understand because we know that the power operator will uh, act on the quantum message. And if the power operator will be the matrix, the identity matrix, then Bob will be able to get the message. Otherwise, he will get the wrong, uh, uh, the wrong message. And given a, set, uh, a certain set of few error, stabilizer, and logical uh, power operator, then we develop the algorithm that the ones as should be the most efficient at the optimal realization of a decoder of a different layer. Now I let you, Irina, to speak to explain. 
Okay, so sorry, this is going to be a little bit technical because uh, we're programmers, we have to talk about details. Uh, so when we have uh, um, concatenation algorithms, the idea is that we take, uh, we take the system and we encode it in a bigger system and uh, like this we can uh, uh, reduce the error. So each level in the, in the tree reproduce uh, the encoding level. Here, uh, this, this is a tree with only like three nodes because, uh, well, it's impossible to draw five on a picture. It looks uh, way too uh, crowdy. So uh, just imagine that you see five. So we did it on the five qubits. That's why it's five. And uh, um, our, um, okay, let's say, yeah, okay. So the idea is that we work on uh, five, uh, five qubits. So we put them through the, that uh, function that uh, we didn't uh, write on the slides because it's too complicated. No one's going to pay attention anyway. It's uh, in the article. So uh, we work with our five qubits and then uh, we pass the information to the next level. Basically, uh, this is uh, uh, this concatenation that uh, the article was discussed uh, was using this message passing algorithm meaning that what we pass is uh, the state that, uh, uh, well, that we calculated like knowing the initial uh, error for the uh, simulator, and we pass the probabilities that the decoder guessed, basically. And uh, uh, when you ask this question, what's the difference between us, like the straight line and the dash there? So uh, here, uh, uh, one of them was when you pass all the probabilities at each level, and then you use them in the next algorithm. And the other was uh, that uh, you take uh, like the maximum of them and you only set that to, uh, to one and then the rest is zero. So it's a little, becomes a different algorithm, a little bit different and it scales worse and it's, uh, so it's better to pass the probabilities. So that was what we were implementing with passing the probabilities. Now, uh, when you look at this tree, so, uh, well, power of five, you can imagine how fast this grows. There is no way you can store this thing uh, in, uh, in memory. So uh, we had to design like the way to go around the tree but not store this. So basically, uh, as I showed, we started with just this. We pass one, uh, uh, one message to the next level. Then we go here, we pass one more message. You see now we have like uh, two things at the next level. And basically in this algorithm, we never have to store any more than just the number of qubits per level of the information. So even though this is uh, exponentially many things, uh, you don't need terabytes of memory, you only need uh, just uh, one matrix to store those uh, five per level. So you just go around, once you got five at this level, you pass it further, and then you just continue. You go, uh, you go down and you continue passing like this. At the end, you have some result. So you have uh, this uh, state that you calculated from your like, initial error things, and uh, uh, you have uh, what the decoder guessed, the probability. So basically, you can compare them. You can say, did it work, didn't work, or like, did not work. So uh, then, uh, what, what do you do to estimate how, how this actually works? So you do the Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah, so in one run, we, we introduce an error, we know what is the error, and then we compare if our decoder is able to, to get, to, to find this error or not. And then we do this many times, this is the Monte Carlo part, and we count how many misses we had, how many times the decoder was not able to find the errors, and we estimated the probability of error. It's the, the graph that we reproduced that we were able to, to do as in the reference. So in the first column we have, for zero, we have the physical error, and then here are the levels of concatenation. What is the, 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 the best result? The best result is that uh, my decoder uh, finds all errors, so we, we have a probability of error zero. And this is able, we, we can see, we are able to achieve this 
till certain levels. Uh, if uh, the level of error is greater than this, uh, the algorithm is not able to, to do. We also timed our algorithm for different concatenation levels, and we observed that it increases exponentially. And this is what we expect, because in each, with each concatenation level, the data we are dealing with increases exponentially as well. So let's go on to the last two slides. So in conclusion, we observed that our algorithm scales lin linearly with the number of qubits, as we expect. And it varies exponentially with the number of layers, as expected again. So it's good. We were able to reproduce the exact same results that we were supposed to reproduce. And we are successfully getting the exact scaling, be scaling behavior that we wanted to get. Uh, so let's move on to the new things that we added in our implementation. First is we implemented our tree algorithm. And this algorithm has never been done in this way. So we are the first ones to implement the tree algorithm. Uh, the major advantage for tree algorithm is that you don't have to deal, deal with terabytes of data in one time, but you can take just uh, five blocks of memory. And people usually you, you do this in different ways, but we did it by implementing a tree. And secondly, this is the first and the uh, and also, this tree can also be used in another, other applications, not just this application. So other industrial applications can use this tree. Secondly, this is the first and the only Python code which does this. So we can even make a module out of this after cleaning it up a bit and optimizing it. Thirdly, uh, since all of us come from a HPC background, we believe that this code can be optimized so much better because we just had two days, so we just wrote it in Python, and we could do it in C or C++, because Python has nasty way of memory allocation. So, and implementing a tree in Python is worse. So I feel our estimate is that it will at least be 20 times faster if we do it on uh, C or C++. And with this, uh, we would like to thank all the organizers, jury, and all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have very good timekeeping, by the way. Uh, we have five minutes for questions. Um, I was curious about the noise model. Uh, how did you introduce the noise? Was it uh, like a do you, like the code capacity or the circuit level, or I don't know if you know those terminologies, but yeah, could you explain more about? Was right model. about saying I, I don't know if we know this terminology because uh, yeah we are uh, not really specialists in quantum sure. computing sure. so uh, we were given you know an algorithm that has some god given input so noise is somewhere there in this god given input and then uh, we get uh, uh, you know stabilizers for like for this uh, five qubits we worked on five qubits but this algorithm can be implemented on whatever so. Someone who is a quantum computer scientist should give us, uh, uh, you know, this how many qubits, uh, what they come from, uh, whatever history it is, and then uh, we encode this, uh, you know, in stabilizers and all the uh, pure error, whatever other things there are, and run the code. So I cannot really answer about the noise because uh, this is a question for quantum computer scientists. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. But we use a random. Uniform generator with that probability of uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.15. Yeah, this. Uh, so, so you have like uh, some qubits, you apply some noise to it, and then you measure the, the operators, the, the, the parity checks, and uh, from those. It's like, well, this is the er just for error correction. So you have this uh, qubit, and then you introduce the error randomly, basically. Yeah. It's the thing. Have some. You have the initial, the, the, you have the probability of this uh, uh, qubit to, uh, to be like an error one error, and uh, uh, then this error it just propagates this uh, okay. thing. And you just, yeah, okay. You use, do you know what uh, sort of simulator you used to, to calculate these things? Yeah, there are two uh, simulators. I mean, so, okay, the, the tree goes like together with, uh, you know, a simulator that gets this error thing and it knows more 
like what it should be because you just multiply Pauli matrices, right? So at the end you get what your similarity has and what your error uh, error decoder guessed at the same time. So like uh, both the decoder and the simulator they are inside the string. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So you find that your um, your stabilizer, your error correction, has a threshold. Yes. Uh, do you did you develop? You didn't do a systematic study, but did you develop an intuition how this threshold should go with the number of qubits? Um, well, mm, probably not really, because uh, you need you know to really implement this as a real uh, task and, and play with number of qubits, then uh, you know, instead of five, you take six or whatever. Uh, it's a good master thesis for us. It will take a lot of time to implement, not, not in one day. That's so that's why um, I wouldn't say I have an intuition. Um, there's something will change, sure. But. And we also discussed this exact same thing with our supervisor, and he said that just do this and uh, because... Because there's no time. <laughs> No, no. Oh, I understand, but uh, I was wondering whether you developed an intuition, okay? This looks like a percolation problem in some sense, on the tree. So maybe, you know, if, if, if you thought, uh, also the threshold is like 1.18, which is more or less one-fifth. This is so. probably a good question for, for Ben, who works on, on this. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now, last but not least, Eigen Criminals. It's giving me the spinning wheel of death. I will shortly move this over. There. It's already very big on the screen, so I'll Excellent. just need yeah. to um, go really full screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
I can I can take your card if you want. Okay, okay. Can you okay, so press the clicker? Is it just the side buttons? Uh, you need to connect to the USB key. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. That's okay. So we can just use the other one. Um, um, my four pointing is just stopped. Oh, okay. Just this is four pointing. There we go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, testing, testing. Awesome. I'm starting to All right, hello everybody. Um, my name is Saket, this is Kevin and Bao. We are the Eigen Criminals. And um, I know you guys have heard quite a few machine learning uh, presentations today. I know there was some VQE, some QAOA, all that good stuff. I'm here to tell you we're not doing any of that. We are doing filtering VQE, sorry. Um, but yeah, before we start, just wanted to give a huge thank you to Gabriel for uh, guiding us through this, teaching us the basics of FVQE, and allowing us to explore and make our own mistakes and discoveries. Um, yeah, so we, first of all, before we talk about what our process with VQE, we talk about what exactly FVQE is. So the problem is that we have a probabilistic distribution of the Hamiltonians of a system, and we want to reach the ground state with a high probability. So as you can see, we perform, in theory, a transform that takes us from a low probability of the ground state to a high probability of the ground state. But we, we call this transform a filter. But for a quantum machine, um, since it's not directly always possible to apply the exact filter on the system, we use a quantum variational algorithm to incrementally modify the landscape of the algorithm. In doing so, we use a cost function. Um, by building a cost function, we can optimize the amount by which our ground state probability tends uh, towards the maximum at each step. And yeah, now for our approach to the project. Um, to begin, Building the cost function, we started by solving the weighted max cut problem. Uh, here we go. There we go. We started by solving the weighted max cut problem. We uh, took the cost function of the problem, integrated it into the uh, FVQE um, using a software called QJAX, which is good for gradients. And we developed Ansatsu for our circuit. So we could initialize our circuit before we implemented FVQE. After which, um, we implemented parameter shift, both um, the theoretical exact parameter shift and an estimation via circuit sampling. Um, after that, we kind of explored FVQE. We looked at uh, the different ansatsa and problem sizes and how well they scale. We looked at various filtering functions to see if we could compose multiple filtering functions together to create a better one. We also looked at multiple hyperparameters, such as uh, tau, which is a hyperparameter in the filtering function, and the learning rate of the VQE itself. And we also capped us off by comparing our solution between a noiseless system and a noisy system. So we tested multiple backends as well. Um, Yeah, so we started with. In essence. Well, we use the, we use the variational quantum algorithm that gives us um, a simulation of, a stepwise simulation of this transform. And step by step, we apply gradient descent and see how well that maps over to uh, this transform. And incrementally, over multiple steps, it simulates something as close as we can approximate to the transform we're looking for. So the filter is, the filter inherently is a function, right? But the function 
what we use is we build that function into the variation algorithm so that we kind of give it a stepwise growth. Could do a better job explaining that again. Going to the first slide. Um, the first, first slide. Yeah, I want to go ahead and explain it. I think I'm not communicating this one. So this function is unitary. Yes. Uh, so the fu the f function shown in this map is unitary. The filtering function overall may not necessarily be unitary, but we break it down. Yeah, uh, we don't implement the exact function. We, we implement an approximation within the VQE. We use, we use the cost function to kind of map it out in a similar manner. Yeah. That approximates the filtering function, yeah. That's right. Okay, um, sorry, yeah. So we started off by uh, solving the max cut problem. Uh, we chose the max cut problem because it's a simple uh, combinatorial optimization problem and therefore it has a very simple cost function to calculate. Um, in theory, this is just a black box because in order to um, initialize the FVQE, we just need some sort of black box function that maps us from X to a function of X. Um, so we used the max cut cost function as a black box with which uh, we'd apply the filtering VQE. We made a graph with weights, we applied the cost function, we solved for the optimal solutions, and we took all the optimal solutions, scaled them between zero and one, and created a Hamiltonian, in a sense, from that. And the lowest entry on that was treated as the ground state, which we were trying to optimize the probability for, or maximize the probability for. After that, uh, we moved over to creating the FVQE circuit itself, which started off with the ansatz. For this, I will hand this off to Kevin. Okay. Well, it turns out that actually we need the ansatz for this to implement the FVQE. So in order to, to do that, we choose these three ansatz that was not selected randomly. We actually, based on this paper, because these three particular ansatz have different levels of expressibility in which we can compare or use like some sort of evaluation in the performance of the FVQE. Okay, so so let's move let's move on to how can I change that? Okay. Okay, so this is the result for the first part of the the ANSAT. So as you can see here, we actually implemented for a, cube, a few number of qubits, just 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11, and 13. And as you can see, actually, in all of these cases, co successfully converse. And we just like have a decreasing of the rate, of the conversion rate, in order, na in order na as we increase the number of qubits. So this is something that actually we take care in the following, in the following implementation. Also, one thing that I want to point out, and in the, next, in the next slide I will do it again, is this kind of fluctuation at the end of the probability of the ground state that as soon as they arrive, well, this can be modified, just changing the learning rate. Okay. Okay, so this is already resolved for the, for the other two answers, the first one and the other two. And I want to see here that, I, I want to show here that actually for the second answer that was the answer that has more expressibility, they has a better, in this case, convergence, convergence rate because it has more parameters so and more expressibility. So we can tend to reach the 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 ground state probability much much faster. Okay. Okay. So what happens when we do these kind of circuits a little bit more bigger? So here you can see that using 19 qubits, we are simulating the ANSATS 1, 2, and 3 with different kind of layer. And also, I, I think that you can see here the number of parameters that each ANSATS require for given a number of, of layers. So it turns out that actually for the case of the ANSATS 2, that is 
well, it has like a 418 parameters, so we just simulate, in this case, just one layer because it has a lot of, of time required to implement these kind of things. Okay, so as you can see here, actually we don't have any kind of problem in case as we increase the number of the number of qubits, but it takes a little bit more of time. So let's move on here. So let me see. So what about the filter? So at uh, this case, I will return this stage to Saket. So. Well, it's not filtering the QE unless we have filters. So what about the filters, right? Um, the most commonly used filters were the inverse exponential, exponential and cosine filter functions. Um, so those were the ones we tried simulating with the cost function. The inverse uh, easily outperformed the other two. We decided to experiment a little bit more and wondered what would happen if we tried composing, uh, composing a filtering function that stacked multiple of these. So for example, um, as you can see in the graph here, um, the, the orange line here is a composition of the inverse and the cosine filter functions, and the green line here is a composition of the inverse and the exponential filter functions. As we can see, compared to all of these, just the, stri uh, just the simple inverse function was the most efficient to map towards, as it not only converged to a high probability the fastest, but it was the only one that lasted for more than seven qubits. Afterwards, all of the other composition functions tended towards a zero probability for the ground state. After we finished comparing the filters, we moved on to hyperparameter comparisons. Uh, the first we tested was the tau hyperparameter that was in the filtering functions. We tested this for a range of values from 0 0.01 to 5. Um, our conclusion was pretty straightforward. It showed that uh, a high tau would lead to a faster uh, growth in the curve, and therefore it would reach a high probability faster. But at the same time, no matter what value of tau we used for the most part, the system was pretty robust in handling the change. We also tried with variable taus. So we built this in such a way that the tau would adjust, in a sense, as the probabilities changed. It would be, a, uh, we built it as an adjustment function of the cost function. And even with that, up to 19 qubits, we saw no difference at all in the growth of the curves. After we checked the tau, we also checked out the learning rates. Unlike the tau, we saw a great deal of difference with these. Um, for consistent learning rates, we tested from 0 0.1 through 1. As you can see over here, the lower learning rates didn't converge quickly enough. About 0 0.35 was a very good convergence. Anything over that, the system would overcorrect itself and fluctuate a lot as it got near a high um, probability rate. In theory, the highest rate possible would be pi over two. Anything beyond that would converge pretty much immediately to a zero probability. But, but we were able to figure out a way to stabilize uh, up top by creating a, an adaptive learning rate that was a function of the cost function and the learning rate itself. So we realized that this works really well. Um, the optimal learning rate that worked for this was a 0 0.9 learning rate. After this, we tested on noisy and noiseless systems for, um, sorry, we used the IBM Q Hanoi um, noisy backend to simulate. We did noisy simulations for three qubits, five qubits, seven qubits, nine qubits, and 11 qubits for the for the unsots that worked the best uh, earlier on, since it was too big for multiple qubits on a noisy backend, we only tested for three and five qubits. The rest we used unsots of one and three. As we can see, as the qubit size, uh, as the uh, number of qubits increases, the adaptive learning rate did function the best out of everything. And I think that's the conclusion is we were able to build a simulation of the filtering functions using FVQE. Um, creating an adaptive learning rate gave us a very good um, convergence towards a high probability, whereas other variables were a little bit less rewarding. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> that leaves us, let's say, okay, two minutes for questions.
Hi. Can we go back to how the filter is applied? Um, this was a classical problem. The Hamiltonian is diagonal, right? Mm, yes. Could you apply this filter technique to a quantum Hamiltonian? To a quantum Hamiltonian? Yeah. Um, I, in theory, I don't see why not. In practice, we haven't tested it out yet. That's actually something we were... It's, it's an in theory question. Right. Is um, there any obstruction? Because the filter, can the way in which you apply the filter be generalized to Hamiltonians that are generic and non-diagonal, like chemistry, whatever? Maybe if you explain how do you apply the well, filter. So, yeah, we applied the filter just by using the, uh, the filter was applied over the values of the eigenstates themselves. So even in a more quantum, like a proper quantum Hamiltonian, like as long as we're optimizing just for increasing the probability of the uh, ground state, which is the lowest eigenstate, it's definitely possible to apply filters <coughs> and do that. Which is the whole pro point of quantum Hamiltonians. Yeah. So for classical Hamiltonians, maybe it's much easier to apply these filters. Perhaps. Yeah. So obviously what we did here is the cost function we used was um, from the max cut problem, which is a classical computing problem. So the data sets we generated as a result of that. And the cost right. And this is why you can apply your classical function directly in the cost function. Because right. you know the energies. Right. And you know what the eigenstates are. Yeah. Right. And, and you are applying it on the energies directly. Right. Right? Right. Okay. okay. I see. That clears okay. stuff up there. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that closes the hackathon, I think. I think upstairs they are. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I'm pretty sure not everyone is here, but um, one piece of info at, at least to start with. Uh, there's no lunch here, as was said this morning. The lunch will be at the um, cocktail place. The shuttle start at 1.15 for the first shuttle and 1.45 for the second one departing from here. Yeah, so you've got time to chill and to starve for a bit. <laughs> <laughs>